Welcome to um, another of BirdLife Australia's Powerful Owl videos. Uh, we're going to be producing a few of these, um, so just keep an eye out for, for other content. Um, and just want to say, you know, quite obviously, uh, we wouldn't be able to do what we're able to do without the support of our, of our sponsors. And more importantly, uh, we wouldn't be able to, to, to do any of this project really without the hundreds of volunteers who get involved. Um, it does take a huge amount of effort to do what we're doing, and that's only possible because we have so many volunteers involved. So I want to talk in, in this video just a, a little bit more about uh, what's been learned generally about the Powerful Owl and what, what we've learned on the project uh, so far. This is uh, some radio tracking that was done in New South Wales. It was a powerful owl in, in Sydney. And every night, you know, that bird is flying up to 10 kilometers a night to get its, its food. So it's covering a remarkable distance. If you drive 10 kilometers in the city on a bad day of traffic, that's going to take you, you know, maybe four hours, right? And those birds could find a possum in your backyard. You know, they could find a possum in the park, you know, they, all over the place, right? So they could show up in a lot of different places occasionally. But their core bit of habitat will be that bit of forest um, that they're using regularly. And so, you know, 100 square kilometers is this bird's home range, and that's not unusual for powerful owls, you know, to have a, a quite a large home range. But this is another bird, and this bird happens to live right near a big supermarket with lots and lots of possums. So it doesn't have to go very far to get its food. It can fly every night about two kilometers, goes to the supermarket, the possum supermarket, and comes home. So it doesn't have to go nearly as far. And there's examples in both New South Wales and Victoria where powerful owls are breeding only 500 meters apart. So if there's lots of food available and good habitat, you can have these birds in really high densities. So home range size just varies um, primarily with food, food availability. How many possums are there in the landscape? And it's not just possums, so these birds do eat other things. So this is kind of a breakdown of what they eat in those natural old growth forests. And this is what the birds eat in kind of the cities. And this is New South Wales, so Sydney. And the big difference there is they eat more brush-tailed possums in the cities. But otherwise, the diet is quite similar. Except there's a couple of birds in... Sydney that are starting to eat rats and rabbits and yes there's even the odd record of a powerful owl eating a cat if you had asked me 10 20 years ago do powerful owls eat things off the ground I would have said no they only eat things in the trees they only eat arboreal prey um, but they're starting to shift their diet they're proving to be very good urban adapters learning how to exploit the novel ecology that's emerging in these urban environments. So that's a good news story. The bad news story, you know, they do tend to reproduce really well in the cities as well, but there's a cost to living in the city. You're more likely to die due to electrocution. So about 5% of Sydney's powerful owls are lost each year due to electrocution. So that's um, about 15 birds that are lost each year on average. And this isn't something that's systematically reported. You know, not everybody's checking every power line. So the number could be higher than that. And similarly, um, you know, up to 20, up to 15%, sorry, birds, 15% um, of powerful owls are, are killed due to collision. So that translates in Sydney with 300 birds, that's 45 birds a year. Add on electrocution, you know, that's 60 birds a year that are getting wiped out every year. So again, if you live in the cities, you're likely not gonna live as long. And um, 
so far in in um, in Queensland, we haven't observed any aggressive behavior to speak of, really. Um, if you do run into it, please let us know. And we're starting to get these data on um, mortality, even though we're not really looking for it. You know, people are just reporting it to us. So we're already starting to get data on how, how owls are dying on the roads. We've learned a lot. Um, two se 2017, we did a pilot study in Brisbane City Council. And at that time, we thought, oh, well, maybe there's 25, 50 pairs of powerful owls in southeast Queensland. Um, a couple of years later, you know, we think, well, maybe there's somewhere between 150 and 300 pairs in, in southeast Queensland. So we've learned a lot in a short period of time regarding the, the distribution of these birds in the landscape. Uh, Michelle Fung at uh, the University of Queensland was a, a student uh, who did a placement with us and she did some preliminary species distribution modeling of, of powerful owls in, in southeast Queensland. So this is southeast Queensland. The blue areas are predicted to be unsuitable. Uh, the red areas and other areas are predicted to be suitable habitat. Uh, these models don't have enough data yet to drive really accurate predictions, the kinds of predictions that we want to give planners and managers. So we need some more data to drive um, better models, but these are great for giving us an indication of where, where we might want to look for these birds. So um, a great step forward in that regard. We're also getting a lot more data on other owls, um, but not as much as I thought would have thought for some species. So mast owl, not nearly as many records as I would have thought. And they're a hard species to identify. Um, their habitat might not overlap a whole lot with powerful owls, um, but I would have expected a few more sightings than that. Um, and then on the other hand, I wouldn't have expected nearly this many sightings of barking owl. So we're getting a lot more barking owl records. So more, more records are starting to come in for other nocturnal species. Um, more records for marbled frogmouth than I would have thought um, are already starting to come in. So having people out and about is, is helping us identify uh, a lot of other things, not just powerful owls. Now I want to talk a little bit about survey bias. So um, this is a map of all the bird records, the location of all the bird records that I could find on the planet, whether it's eBird, Bird Data, WildNet, ALA, any database I could find. Those black areas in Queensland are places where you could go out and be an explorer and you could um, be the first person to ever record what kinds of birds are in that location. There's still a few places in southeast Queensland where you could go and be an explorer, but not nearly as many as there used to be but tons and tons of records, the blues and the purples, in places around Brisbane. Places where there's lots of people, there's lots of records. That's not a surprise. But if we naively ask a question of the available data, and we go, well, where are the private properties in southeast Queensland where the most threatened birds occur? The answer we get is, well, the most threatened birds are found right here around Brisbane. There's hardly any private properties out here that have threatened birds in them. Well, surely that's not true. It's just because of a lack of records that we don't know where the threatened species are in these private properties out uh, further west. So that's why modeling is, is such an important component of a lot of what we do in Australia is so much of the continent just doesn't have that much data uh, to drive our understandings of what's going on. If people do get involved and with the Powerful Owl Project, um, you know, some people who've gotten involved uh, never get around to going out, which is fair enough. There's all kinds of, you know, I have a family and a job and other things. I understand that. Um, but some people are able to go out, you know, really catch the bug and go out in like 90 times. We're suggesting that if you go out um, about once a week, roughly, as possible, you'll solve the powerful owl riddle in that location. And if you share that load among a few other people, then you don't even have to go out very often at all. 
to, to solve that riddle. Um, so you don't have to go out heaps, but and people go out different amounts, just depending on how, how much they catch the owl bug, I suppose. And when people go out, some people don't walk very much. Some people walk on average 10 kilometers each time they go out. But on average, most people on average walk three kilometers every time they go out. So they're getting a bit of exercise. It's good for you. Um, and you get onto all kinds of cool critters, which you'll learn about in some of the other videos besides powerful owls. Most of the people who get involved say they learn something. About um, half of the people say that getting involved with the project is helping them reconnect with the natural world. It's just getting them outdoors more than they were uh, before they got involved with the project, which is great. And we've got about 30% of people who are meeting other people that they didn't know before, becoming friends with, um, and, and going out, um, you know, forming those social connections with people who are kind of like-minded. And we don't have any marriages on the project yet, but um, we're only two years in, in Brisbane, so give it time, I reckon. Um, this is a, a plot of uh, bird data records that people submit. A, a third of people roughly submit bird, bird data records every time they go out. And ideally, that's what we'd like to see everyone doing, is submitting a bird record, even if you see zero birds. About a third of the people don't do that. They only record birds when they see a bird. And about a third of the people aren't giving us their records at all, but they did respond to the survey. So um, we got a bit, a, a bit of work to do before we get 100% of the effort captured in bird data. And the reason capturing that effort is really useful is the models that I've talked about so far are based on this Maxent um, maximum entropy algorithm, right? That uses presence only data. And it's really good at what it does. But it turns out you can get some slightly more accurate models at more accurate predictions if you use something called an occupancy model. Because an occupancy model models both the probability of presence given the habitat as well as the probability given the um, detection probability. So giving, given the likelihood that you're going to actually find those birds. And it turns out there's all kinds of variables that are related to how likely you are to find a pair of birds. How big is the forest? If it's a really big forest, you're less likely to find the birds. How many people are going out? Turns out um, as the number of people increases, your detection probability goes up. You're more likely to see an owl until you get to, you know, somewhere between five and ten people. And then once you get more than ten people, well, everybody's chatting to one another and nobody's really paying attention, and your detection probability starts to fall again. So, and some observers are better at finding birds than others. All of these variables are things you can play with, which helps deliver better detection probabilities. And all we need is when you go out and you don't see an owl, but you were looking for an owl, just send us a record with a zero in it. Very, very, very useful. So this last summer in Eastern Australia was an absolute game changer for uh, forest ecology. Uh, certainly in our lifetime, we have not seen um, fires like this. And so this is some modeling I did uh, a, a couple of months ago. And this is the probability of, of powerful owls being found in eastern Australia. The red is much more likely to occur, the blue less likely. If we break that into a map of mm, pretty likely and white, uh, definitely not likely. Um, and we overlay the fire impacted area, you know, you can see that the fires impacted a huge amount of, of powerful owl habitat. And in fact, all the forest owls got, got impacted in eastern Australia. Anywhere from 30 to 40 percent of the areas that these birds are predicted to occur was impacted by fire. Now, when people evacuated from the fire, some of them returned to, the, to their houses to find it was still standing. 
That's certainly possible in the case of some powerful owls. But an old 100 to 500 year old tree with hollows in it is more likely to have been burnt up in the fire than most of the other trees. And when a fire tears through a territory, you're almost certainly gonna get a reduction in the amount of prey. So the birds, if they do have a nesting hollow left, are going to have to grow their territories to much bigger sizes in order to get enough food to eat. So I am expecting there's a lot of powerful owls where you know all of the habitat's been raised and they've just had to leave, or where powerful owl territories have grown to the point where some powerful owls need to leave. I'd expect powerful owls to be floating around, um, not able to breed, and showing up this year in a lot of unusual locations. Um, and I'd expect a lot of those birds won't survive in the long term. So a huge impact um, that will be, I think, felt for many years on many forest species in, in Eastern Australia, but including the powerful owl. So um, that's just a bit of what we've learned so far. We have a lot left to learn. And the cool thing about science is uh, the more you learn, the more you learn you don't know, and the more interesting questions that arise. But we still have you know, some real basic questions that we need to answer if we're gonna conserve this bird. So I hope you'll get involved with the project um, in the coming months and years.